This was supposed to be a different video. I was researching and writing a video on friction and how it pertains to Pokemon's ice puzzles. And this video will still contain a lot of that original material. But while I was researching for that video, I made a startling discovery that honestly derailed everything. The universe of Pokemon has a solution right under their noses right now to one of the great unsolvable problems in physics. Perpetual motion, free energy, unlimited resources. All of this and more is possible in the world of Pokemon. Join me as I tell you the story of what happened over the last two months and how I arrived at this shocking conclusion. Okay, I started researching friction and the ice puzzles in Pokemon because I'm really bad at ice puzzles. Like, really bad. And I consider myself a pretty good Pokemon gamer. I've competed in big tournaments, I've done speedruns on the big stage, I've completed some of the hardest possible Pokemon challenge runs you can even do, and yet, Ice puzzles are my absolute kryptonite and have been since I was a child. I, I can't do it. He slides okay, up and down, he goes up and right, but he doesn't stop. Like, but he keeps going. going. How does all the children go, you solve this? Right. You gotta how? be immense. How? How? What's going children, on how? Now, this might seem like a non-issue to you, and fair enough. It's a little embarrassing, sure, but why does it matter? Well, the problem is that I promised my Twitch chat a few months ago that I would do a playthrough of a modified version of Pokemon Emerald where the whole world is an ice puzzle. I simply was not ready for that. There's no way I was going to be able to do that without doing my due diligence and researching friction and figuring it all out. That was the premise for the video. That was the silly little hook. But as I started digging into whether or not these ice puzzles were possible in the real world, I made a startling realization about the ice in the world of Pokemon. There is no friction. Well, at least almost none. The thing that got me into physics, like with so many people, was classical mechanics. This is Newton's baby boy. It's what he invented his calculus for, and as insanely annoying as the guy probably was to be around, it's crazy beautiful. Like, his classical mechanics and his calculus are so good, and they mesh together so nicely, it's honestly stupid. And probably the most amazing thing, and the reason it gets so many people into studying physics, is that the calculus isn't necessary to express everything. Simple algebraic statements can describe the motion of so many macro systems in the world. How much weight can that bridge hold? How fast is that car moving? When will that train arrive? All of that is possible with algebra. And when you're describing the movement of things with Newton's classical mechanics, few forces are more important than friction. Friction keeps cars' tires on the road, it prevents you from slipping when you walk. It is essential to everyday existence. What's up gamers, I'm just checking in on you to make sure you're still enjoying the video. If you are, I've got tons more like this and tons more in the pipeline, so consider subscribing. The button's right below the video, it takes two seconds, and it really does help. Okay, back to the video. At its core, friction is the force that acts between two surfaces that are in contact, especially in the presence of relative motion. But you already know that intuitively. Friction is the reason why it's so easy to slide across hardwood floors in your socks, but how relatively difficult that task is in comparison on carpet. It's the, it's the ease of sliding a, a newly peeled banana across freshly blown glass, but how relatively difficult that task is across sand. You know, normal stuff that everyone thinks about. People have been studying friction for as long as people have been studying motion. The ancient Greeks and Romans like Aristotle or Pliny the Elder wrote about friction, Da Vinci wrote about friction, Newton couldn't get enough of the stuff, and that dude never left his house. Basically, all the weirdest smart dudes throughout history have cared a lot about the friction between two surfaces. Really makes you think. So how do we use math to describe the friction force? Well, let's look at sliding a box along ice and let's make a free body diagram, which is where we draw all of the relevant forces that are affecting an object onto the object. As we slide the box, there's four forces present. First, there's the force of pushing the box. Then, as Newton's third law of motion dictates, there must be an equal and opposite force acting back. In this case, friction is preventing you from pushing the box faster. Next, we have the box's weight force acting down on the ice, and the weight force's third law pair is the ice quote-unquote pushing 
back on the box to prevent it from falling through the earth and destroying whoever is on the other side of the planet right now. That force that a surface enacts back on an object that's on it is called the normal force. But I wanna be very crystal clear about this. I think a lot of students, myself included, when you first learn about the normal force, misunderstand what it means. Normal here does not mean the regular force. In mathematics, normal means perpendicular. This force is just a force that acts perpendicularly back up on an object that is on a surface. That's it. All right, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, guys. We're in trouble, all right? The video is on ice puzzles and friction, but the sponsored segment is FlexiSpot, who wants us to show off their ergonomic C7 Max chair which boasts top-of-the-line affordability, comfort, and build quality. Which is great, except the best idea we have right now is that chairs have wheels, and wheels need friction to work. Which isn't a very good idea, that's like saying people need air to breathe. What else we got? Uh, well, we know it's better than ADEF's previous chair, which is totally busted and not very comfortable. Uh, what else we got? You know what, why don't we just go to a live feed of the big man himself and see what he thinks? He probably has some good ideas, right? All right. Oh, oh, hey guys, uh, do you mind? I'm kind of busy, right? I'm actually writing the sponsored segment for this video right now. Uh, it's kind of involved, it's like a skit within a skit where we like go into my brain and then we come back out and I'm writing the thing. I don't know, it seems like a lot even for this channel. But, uh, oh yeah, the chair, uh, the C7 Max. So I've actually edited and written basically this entire video in the chair and I've really enjoyed the upgrade. Uh, it has these 5D arm rests, which make a fun noise and they also rotate every which way and go up and down, which is great. The lumbar support is adjustable. The whole chair can be raised and lowered on the back, which is great. Uh, the headrest moves, the chair goes forward and back, up and down. And the seat is just really comfortable. It's been a really great upgrade, so I genuinely like the chair. Uh, okay, did I fulfill all my obligations? Can we please, can I go back to work, please? Thank you. Okay, well that wasn't much help, but he did kind of hit 90% of the talking points sort of just by accident, so I'm just gonna close up with the call to action, and then we'll get out of here and get back to our day jobs of overthinking every single conversation that ADEF has ever had. Sound good? Okay, great. Black Friday is coming, and you can snag the best discounts on FlexiSpot's C7 Max chair, standing desks, and more at FlexiSpot.com. Use code 24BFC7 to save an extra $50 on the C7 Max chair, and check out this calendar for a chance to win free orders. Okay guys, get back to work, and uh, let's get back to the video. How do we express friction? It just so happens that through experimental testing, physicists were able to determine that the relationship between two surfaces and how frictive they are to one another. Oh, by the way, I'm really trying to get frictive to catch on. So, you know, it's like, uh, how much friction was there in the system? How frictive was it? I don't know, give it a shot, maybe it'll work. Anyway, that relationship between two surfaces, it has to do with the normal force. In fact, it turns out that it's the normal force times a constant the coefficient of friction, which is represented by the lowercase Greek letter mu. Nope, not that one. That would be, that would be really convenient though. But this coefficient of friction is different for every two surfaces in the world and has to be experimentally determined by measuring how two surfaces or objects move when in contact with one another. For instance, the coefficient of friction for ice sliding on ice is very low. The objects are easy to slide on one another, whereas aluminum on aluminum is much higher. But of course, this also depends on if the surfaces have been lubricated, how clean they are, if they have any surface imperfections, and so on. But generally speaking, there are two kinds of friction, static and kinetic. If the friction is preventing the movement of the object on a surface, then it's static friction. If the object is already sliding and there's friction present, then it's kinetic. The coefficients of friction for static and kinetic are often different. You can think about it like moving a piece of furniture on a rug. It's really hard to get the couch moving initially, but once it's already sliding, it's much easier to push. The friction between the two surfaces then has to be different if the object is stationary versus already moving. This is really important for a later discussion we're gonna have about energy transfer, so keep it in mind. Now, as for what the normal force is equal to, the good news is that the vast majority of the time, it's just equal to the weight force, since they are both Newton's third law pairs. And the weight force we know is equal to the mass of the object times gravity, so the normal force is almost always just equal to the same thing, the mass of the object times gravity, which means the friction force often winds up being m times g times mu. Now, 
This is only different usually if the object is at an incline, but we're not gonna worry about that right now because I simply cannot be bothered to go into cosine theta at the moment. Any cosine theta heads in the chat, I'm so sorry, she will not be making an appearance today. Great, that's friction. I was ready, or now at least I thought I was in the original draft of this script, to move on to the ice puzzles and show you how or why they could or could not work based on the friction we just arrived. But that's when it happened. To figure out the coefficient of friction between the player and the ice, I chose to do my estimations in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, since those games have a ton of hard ice puzzles that have given me a lot of trouble over the years, and the Pokedex has a conveniently listed height for the protagonists. They're both 1.5 meters tall, or 4 foot 11 inches. That information isn't present at all in the Gen 2 Pokedex, so it's just really nice to have it here. I then used their height to estimate the width of one tile, which came out to be about 1.125 meters. Then I was going to use that width, along with how many frames it took to travel along a tile at top speed, to determine max velocity of sliding, and then using that I could figure out how long it took to decelerate to a stop while sliding, and then with that acceleration from max speed to zero, I could use the fact that Newton's second law dictates that mass times acceleration equals the net forces on an object to isolate mu with some algebra, and boom, I'd be able to derive the coefficient of kinetic friction. But that, my friends, is when it happened. I'd gotten lost in the weeds and so easily forgotten a simple truth about the ice puzzles in the Pokemon series. You don't stop sliding unless you hit something. You just go forever. There's no friction, none, zero. This is a problem. It invalidates basically everything we know about physics. Okay, I wanna get two things clear right away. First of all, there's no such thing as free energy. Anytime you see a video titled free energy machine or perpetual motion machine, it's fake every single time. If it were real, then Asuka number one fan 420, or whoever uploaded the video, would immediately win the Nobel Prize for Physics, and probably engineering as well, and be lauded a hero for single-handedly solving the energy crisis and saving humanity. It's not real. You can't get energy from nowhere. It's not possible. The first law of thermodynamics, the fundamental first thing that all of the thermo dynamicists or whatever want you to remember is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It has to come from somewhere. The line that everyone loves to quote in the comment section of any perpetual motion machine video is, the hard part of making a perpetual motion machine is where to hide the batteries. There is some trick to all of these videos every single time. Perpetual motion isn't possible because you need energy to get an object started moving, and then once it's started moving, you need energy to keep it moving because all the forces in the universe are acting against the thing to try to stop it from moving. They're all stealing energy from it. Whether it's friction or air resistance or even loss of internal energy, everything acts against the object. You have to keep pumping energy in. That's why people use batteries or magnets that are powered by batteries in perpetual motion machines because they can secretly add more energy back into the system. Now, the reason friction is so important to our discussion of loss of energy is because friction is probably the most common way that macro-sized systems lose energy in motion. When two things are in contact with one another and try to move, they will lose some energy to heat every time. This is the basis behind rubbing two sticks together to start a fire. Generate enough high intensity friction and you can generate enough heat to maybe start a fire. I mean, think about the fact that when a car skids to a halt from like 50 or 60 miles an hour, the rubber on the tires literally burns and melts on the road. Friction releases a ton of a system's energy in the form of heat. But why does this matter? Well, basically every way we have to generate power relies on turbines. Nuclear power plants use nuclear fission to heat fluids that turn turbines that we can then store as energy. Wind turbines use wind to turn turbines. Hydroelectric dams use water to turn turbines. You know how they all lose energy? Well, in a lot of ways, optimizing energy conversion is probably one of humanity's greatest single enemies, but friction is truly one of the biggest ways that a system loses energy. It is really, really hard to keep something moving forever once it's started moving. You're always working against nature to keep big stuff or anything moving. 
Whether it's the cogs of gears turning against one another, or something rubbing up against the turbine walls, or the rods the turbines are spinning on, you can lube them up as much as you want, you're always losing energy to heat from friction somewhere. That's why the ice puzzles in Pokemon are so remarkable. You just go forever until you hit something. But there is one instance of friction in these ice puzzles, static friction. You have to be able to start moving somehow. When the player character is at rest on the ice, you can start moving again in any direction. That implies that there is static friction between the player's shoes and the ice, at least at the beginning, to allow them to accelerate. But it seems that once you overcome the static friction and become a kinetic sliding system, you begin to slip. And then you're on a constant trajectory in whatever direction you were going. Seemingly, not only is there no kinetic friction, there's no air resistance, nothing. The ramifications of this are incredible. It is this dual property that the ice has static friction, but magically no kinetic friction, that makes this system so potentially powerful. You can start moving something with real physical purpose because you have grip at the beginning, which is advantageous, and then it moves forever. This is, in some ways, better than if there were no friction at all. Here in Ice Puzzle World, we have the advantage of having something to latch onto to get moving, but then once it starts moving, we have the benefit of having zero resistance against our system forever. The potential applications for this technology are limitless. The world of Pokémon doesn't seem to have energy completely solved yet. I mean, after all, there is the Valley Windworks in Sinnoh, there are coal mines and like oil refinery plants in various regions, so they're not at nuclear fusion or free energy yet, just like us. But what's frustrating is that they have a solution right under their noses. If you can get a turbine spinning on the ice, what's to stop it from continuing to move? It's lossless. You have free energy literally forever. Oh, what's that? You think the internal parts of the turbine are gonna be the bottleneck? The gears are rubbing up against one another? The, the, there's gonna be heat when the turbine turns? Just make them out of ice. Just make it all out of ice. Duh! And if you need to stop a turbine from spinning, just put one of the boulders in its path. These are clearly mystical objects from another planet that don't obey the laws of physics either, so just put them there. Everything stops when they touch it. Come on, guys. Is everybody keeping up here? I mean, like, I'm having a meltdown, but there's no reason we can't have it together. Okay, even if you can't solve the energy crisis, you can at the very least solve transportation. Just make all of your highways out of ice and then cover the roads. Yeah, it's gonna be a little energy expensive to keep the roads cool, but surely that's still better than burning a ton of fuels to get all the cars moving, right? Like, for example, uh, oh, what's that, honey? I need to be at my son's graduation in New York City in one hour? <laughs> well, I don't know why you or a hypothetical son have to exist for this thought experiment, but no problem. I'll just hop on the impossibly long ice hyperloop train. <laughs> I mean, come on, are we even having a rational discussion here? Is he summa cum laude? No? Okay, I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't think I'm gonna go.